So good afternoon, everybody. Lizzie and I are live on Facebook. It's three, just after three o'clock in the afternoon in London and some other very early time in Guatemala where Lizzie is. And we're so glad that you're with us and um, glad to be doing this again. Thank you for those of you who've been waiting a few minutes. We ran into some technical difficulty getting started. So um, we have a, a really exciting source to talk about this week. And um, I'm not going to say any more, see what Lizzie has to say and then we can read. So morning everybody from Guatemala, it's very, very early here as Justin said and quiet and the sun is shining and it's a bright blue sky. This is the second Sunday joining you from Guatemala and I'm um, yeah, amazed by the miracle of the technology that's possible to have this happen, it's really quite something. And I'm sitting here feeling glad to be where I am and also seeing Justin sip a cup of tea and feeling like, oh, a really nice cup of tea in my and of ordinary environment is also a very beautiful thing. So, um, but I'm very, very happy as always to be here and doing this, having these conversations. And I love this source as well. Got me all mm. kind of excited and um, enlivened when I saw what it was on Friday. I'm having two thoughts um, before we start. One is, <clears throat> I've been uh, watching you, Lizzie, in these beautiful places that you're in in Guatemala and uh, appreciating the beauty of them and I, I'm glad that you're talking about cups of tea because it it seems to me that <clears throat> sometimes what turns out to be most important is a cup of tea or a conversation or a walk in the woods or something that's near mm. and it's easy when certainly I find it very easy when faced with a beautiful other possibility and, and away from here possibility to imagine that that's where life is going to be happening if only I were in Guatemala where you are mm. where it's warm and tropical and beautiful and the sky is blue <clears throat> and it's not a uh, rainy Easter Sunday like it is here in London and it's so important I find it so important to remember that uh, in the end it's not usually that that's most important I think we lost Lizzie here for a moment let's see what happens if she comes back with us so the, the second thing I was going to say whilst we wait to see what happens with Lizzie is 25 years ago, I was a computer science student. And at the time that I was a computer science student, I worked in, I uh, was uh, doing my studies in a department in University College in London where they were doing a research project to see if it was possible to have uh, video over the internet. So the early experiments We've totally lost Lizzie now. I'm sure she'll come back in in a second. The early experiments with uh, video on the internet were causing great excitement. They had managed to send a short uh, stream of video where you could see what was happening and hear what was happening. And the uh, research project was, um, can this extend? Can this be um, made more widely available? And here we are broadcasting live from different parts of the world with many people watching. It's an absolutely extraordinary thing that we can do this the stuff when I was growing up, certainly of science fiction. So this is um, a collaboration between two people. So it comes from a, a writer whose work I love, whose name is Courtney Martin, and um, an artist whose name I can't remember at the moment, but we will find again. So uh, these are Courtney Martin's words. And if you have a look on the Turning Towards Life website or in our Facebook group, you'll see this extraordinary poster version of uh, the source which is an amazing thing I think to um, print out and have available or stick on your desktop or something like this and it goes like this this is your assignment feel all the things feel the hard things the inexplicable things the things that make you disavow humanity's capacity for redemption Feel all the maddening paradoxes. Feel overwhelmed, crazy. Feel uncertain. Feel angry. Feel afraid. Feel powerless. Feel frozen. And then focus. Pick up your pen. Pick up your paintbrush. Pick up your damn chin, put your two calloused hands on the turntables in the clay 
on the strings, get behind the camera, look for that pinprick of light, look for the truth. Yes, it is a thing. It still exists. Focus on that light, enlarge it, reveal the fierce urgency of now, reveal how shattered we are, how capable of being repaired. But don't lament the break. Nothing new would be built if things were never broken. A wise man once said, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Get after that light. This is your assignment. And with perfect timing, Lizzie is back. I'm back. <laughs> what happened? I've got no idea. Somehow my internet has just completely gone. So now I'm on 3G and I'm going to see whether this is strong enough. Okay, well, we can hear you. We're going to have to see how this goes. If, if the technology fails us, we may end up abandoning ship and coming back some other time. But let's see, yeah. let's see what happens. So, Lizzie, whilst you were away, I just read the source for everyone. Oh, shall I read it? Yeah. Okay. Hopefully you can still continue to hear me as I read. We can. This is your assignment. Feel all the things. Feel the hard things, the inexplicable things, the things that make you disavow humanity's capacity for redemption. Feel all the maddening paradoxes. Feel overwhelmed, crazy. Feel uncertain, feel angry, feel afraid. Feel powerless, feel frozen. And then focus. Pick up your pen. Pick up your paintbrush, pick up your damn chin. Put your two calloused hands on the turntables, in the clay, on the strings. Get behind the camera, look for that pinprick of light. Look for the truth. Yes, it is a thing, it still exists. Focus on that light, enlarge it. Reveal the fierce urgency of now. Reveal how shattered we are, how capable of being repaired. But don't lament the break. Nothing new would be built if things were never broken. A wise man once said, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Get after that light. This is your assignment. Thank you, Lizzie. I want to start with um, feel all the things mm. because I know one of the things that I struggle with that this is such a powerful reminder of is to go from I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling afraid I'm feeling ashamed to some, there's something terribly wrong to there's something terribly wrong with me, to there's nothing I could do. Until I feel, until I feel hopeful, until I feel happy or energized or can see new possibility, I should wait. And that mm -hmm. is the easiest thing for me to do. And in fact, um, you and I have spoken about this a lot at various times, Lily. It's a very common experience for me to wake up in this kind of mood. And I, I, without reminders, without something fierce like this around, or without having practices that uh, reawaken me to possibility, mm. it would be really easy for me to wait forever. I'll, I'll act when the conditions are right. And mostly I'm talking about not the conditions in the world, but the inner conditions. So I love... I find this extraordinarily powerful that she says, feel all of this. And then, and then because of all of that, there's something for you to do. And it's, and it's not what my habit would have me do or my thoughts about how things are meant to be would have mm -hmm. me do. Mm -hmm. 
so I, I find myself really that this is sharp for me. It's, um, you know, I read it and, and I feel I get uh, connected back with um, I very powerfully with I have a responsibility here and the responsibility is nothing to do with how I'm feeling. I mean, it is to do with how I'm feeling. But what I mean is it's nothing to do with feeling a particular way. Mm. And it's not even about feeling a particular way that the purpose of um, getting after what's true and getting after the light is not so I'll feel better. I may do. But even that's not the point. So it's one of the reasons why I have this um, large on my desktop, because because I need to remember this. I really, really need to remember this if I'm going to make any kind of contribution. Mm. Yeah, as as you're saying that, it's like for me, it's a kind of a call to consciousness about what's happening, rather than trying to change what's happening. You know, we, I, I feel like, you know, in most systems and most companies and most families and most institutions, there's a way that the kind of cultural, social soup has certain demands on us to feel a certain way or be a certain way. And most of us got directed I think into only feeling a certain repertoire there's a combination of our own kind of personality tendencies plus what's around us shaping us into what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and so much of the time it's not the invitation to feel all the feelings feel frozen feel the hard things like those messages aren't common in our the general way of learning how to be in the world and often we get told to pull ourselves together to stop crying to stop being rageful to stop being angry you know and this seems to me to be a re-welcoming of our experience because it we do feel angry we do feel sad we do feel rageful we do feel injustice very very deeply in the smallest of situations and what I love is the kind of the integrating feeling of this invitation that it matters to allow what's here to be here and to notice it because it feels like this is inviting us to see the origins of social change, which is doing something different than has always been done in lots of circumstances to bring about something different in the world so one thing I notice is that it's not just about you know suddenly somebody making some huge movement that changes the world but this kind of call to action could be about how to be at the breakfast table or how to be in your journaling like the, the ordinary things too you know, picking up a paintbrush and picking up a pen and putting your hands on the decks and into the clay feels like this allowing of our own process to be the creative energy by which things get made, however small or however ordinary or however extraordinary, whatever. It feels like it's making a connection into the rea the reality of our lives and having our life force become manifest in all these different kind of creative ways because of who we are, because of our story, because of our history, because of our feelings, because of our perception of what the world is right now. And that's the exciting thing for me is like, oh, because of me, something might get made. And what if I just put my best foot forward and put my hands on the wheel? and include myself in a creative process is it, instead of feeling like I have to be clean or ready or like you're saying, like in the right frame of mind in order to be a creator. But what if I'm already the creator and I need to put my hands on the wheel and allow who I am just as I am right now in all my brokenness and all my light to be the source of something that got made in, in, in the mess, 
rather than I'm going to do tidying before I get to be the person who makes something. Because hmm. we're always in a mess. That's the first thing. Seems to me the world is a mess. And um, the world will always be a mess. So all of our all of our utopian dreams, which have everything, if we have them like this, which have everything be perfect and predictable, they turn out to be not such great places to live in. Most most attempts to make a perfect utopia have ended in big trouble because they always involve suppressing something. And um, and nevertheless, as you say, the things I was really struck by what you said, Dizzy, was um, that I took was that. The, the way we change things for the better, which is seems to me is all of our responsibility and is well within our grasp is by making stuff. So it might be making things like writing or or painting or singing or clay, but it might be it might be um, the kind of music you play, but it also might be the conversations you make or the meal time that you make. And that that to be human, one of the things that defines being human is that whatever situation we're in, we can always imagine if we'll allow ourselves another way that things can be. We can, we can transcend our own situations and our own habits and our own patterns. So to, so to wait until the conditions are right is always the wrong move because, by, because it's the waiting that keeps our condition going. Mm. And one of the things that's really striking me as we're talking is that there's a difference between feel overwhelmed, feel crazy, feel angry, feel afraid, and then act in a way that keeps that going. So, I, you know, I know I can do this. I'm, I'm really good at this, which is feeling angry and then acting in a way that will fuel my anger. I can be very focused in that way. I, if I'm angry with you, I can make you wrong. I can, I can take action focused action that will keep the darkness going because in some way it makes me feel good self-justified self-righteous mm. what i love about this is feel angry feel afraid feel powerful powerless feel confused feel overwhelmed and then look for where there's light and work to go that way because there's always light even in the midst of the darkness I, I feel like I want to make a really big point about this. And I think I want to make a big point about it because I, because it's a trap that I know I fall into, mm. which is to keep the darkness going, keep it going, keep it going, fuel it, fuel it, fuel it. And that's a choice that we have. And yeah. it's the choice that most easily comes from feeling angry or afraid or, or overwhelmed, actually. Because if I, mm. I, if I feel angry and I don't want to feel ashamed at being angry, <laughs> One of the things I can do is to keep it going. And then I sort of become self justified in this place. Yeah. And to look for the seeds of light that come from my anger. So not trying to make my anger go away, but also not just trying to stoke it for its own sake mm. is how you, is how you focus on um, that, which will be life giving for us. How capable of being repaired as she says we are don't lament the break and build something new yeah and no, really... one last yeah go on i'll say yeah, I've, no, I've got something no. else well it just the, the other thing that was striking me is um uh, it's a very radical thing actually to build something new because um first of all we might not know ourselves and second of all other people might not know us mm. it's very it, it, it's um actually very culturally uh, what's the word I was going to say inappropriate that's not quite the word I'm looking for but uh, easily disapproved of in ourselves and by others to really make something new to really say I made this here it is so there are all of these inner and outer forces which work against this which is why being reminded is so important yeah and what what I want to say relates to both of those things Justin because so I've bought um, Parker Palmer's book with me, The Courage to Teach. And one of the things that moved me yesterday when I was reading um, 
was this piece about community and how one of the elements of cultivating community is our own transparency and the way that we participate with one another is what creates community and so I think he's pointing to or my, at least my interpretation of what he's saying is in order to be in the kind of in the, in the kind of community he's talking about where it's for our development and our transformation and our being held in our own held to our own growth if you like to our own path is that we have to be in conversation about the things that you're talking about like this anger or the self-justification or whatever and in a way because we're in community it allows the light to come in so the fact that we're in conversation about something is one way that we can cultivate the light being perceived in the thing that we think is the darkness and the ever self-perpetuating mess that I'm in. If we're in the kind of community, even a community of two, even just like this between you and I, where there is another who is in service of seeing the light which, by the way, doesn't mean being positive. It's not like I would say, oh, Justin, come on, everything's going to be fine. You're fine. Look at all these other wonderful things in your life. But actually being in the anger with you as somebody who is a, is a light seeker in the context of relationship with you, that's a way that the light can get in because you and I aren't separate. And so if I can find the light, because that's my intention, to be with the light and allow your anger to be the crack where the light is getting through, and I can be conscious about that in relationship and community, that's a really different life than hunkering down lonely in your house trying to get through something and then coming out all fine into the, out the front door the next day with the kind of pain in your heart because you've shoved something down or you've ignored something. And so this piece about community, I feel like I kind of can't not always come back to it again in some way, like whenever we're talking, because this kind of, in a way for me as well, this is the kind of transparency that I always yearned for as a child. And I always yearned for, let's not be one thing in the house and another thing out the house. Like, why does that have to happen? Why do I have to tell people a different story at school that I have to tell myself when I'm at home and this kind of outside is the same as the inside thing feels like such a big facilitator of how the cracks can be held so that the light can get in and us doing this together feels like the gift of treating the cracks like the cracks should be treated and not as you say like there's something wrong with us or something deficient or something bad but that they are just that they are cracks in which the light filters through and we learn and something else happens and we expand and we grow and yeah there's a there's a shift that's possible in uh, inside of us and possibly then in the outside of us because of the kind of conversations like you're saying that we might get to have or the art we might get to make because this piece didn't get written without there being a crack you know, you can't write about being frozen until you felt frozen you can't write about being powerless until you've felt powerless is this making sense? I really making lots mind. of sense. It's making lots of sense, and and um, to me anyway. And I, get, uh, I feel like when I'm feeling like inspired and like breathed into, and not and not kind of um, like I've thought about it very much before. I will often wonder, am I just like, is is, is there something incoherent happening? So it's uh, interesting to hear that it does make some sense, at least to you. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I hear you saying lots of things. What what you're saying is very rich, Lizzie, and one of the parts that I want to pick up on is you talked about transparency and what happens when we're with another around this and I think that 
you're naming something that's really clearly that's implied in this piece but not said in in the way that you're saying so there's something deep and true that you're adding to it by speaking in this way which is our fear our anger our feeling overwhelmed and crazy and powerless is an is an inevitable and full part of the human condition and when we are with one another in relationship with one another one of the paths that we have available to us is to make it known is to make ourselves known to one another and then we can help one another find uh, what the light that's in it what's life-giving and kind and true and compassionate and wise all of that and we need one another to do that because first of all because on our own it's so hard to see it's the easiest thing to do is to spiral down convinced by the fear or the anger of the overwhelm as if that's the only kind of truth that's possible and or, or we try and convince ourselves that it's not the case and when we're with other people who, with whom we can be transparent and who will be a call to our transparency who won't just dive in and go well you're angry so i'll be angry too let's get them you know but who that who'll welcome the anger and welcome the goodness that the anger stands for or the or, or what else is present or the creative possibility that's in this. so i keep on wanting to come back to calling it life-giving there's be lots of different ways of talking about it and you are such a reminder of this that when you talk so often as the, the importance of this and it's super important i think in a in a world in which we somehow we've been taught well we've been taught all kinds of things but one is a sort of kind of self-reliance that mm -hmm. i ought to be able to do this on my own and that then leads to i was thinking as we were coming into the conversation you know the times when i'm feeling despairing and overwhelmed and crazy and i think well what i need is therapy and i think therapy is a wonderful thing but i need therapy and then i'll feel better and then mm. and sometimes that's what's called for but very often what's called for at least in my own life is being with someone they're being in a conversation with you mm. and you welcoming the parts of me that i'm either convinced by and so then also welcoming the other parts of me or welcoming the parts of me that I'm in denial about so that we have a chance of freedom. And, and yeah. the other th thought that was bubbling up as, as you were talking is it's um, in the Jewish world, it's Passover this week. It's uh, Pesach is the Hebrew name for it, which is a festival of freedom. And I was reading about slavery and freedom just today as part of this and that the condition of slavery is when we find ourselves uh, in a fixed pattern and terrified that if we were to step out of the pattern, something awful will happen to us, so we don't. That's what slavery is. And slavery can be imposed upon us, of course, by an unjust political system or in a family system or in an organization. That, that can, but it can also be perpetuated by us because the kind of freedom that you're talking about to, to meet one another and to be honest about ourselves and to make something that could change things in the world that kind of freedom is also comes with a huge responsibility towards one another and sometimes we don't want to take that mm. sometimes it's safer feels safer for us to stay in our own very tight spiral of hiding away and um the last part that came to me whilst you were speaking was I was remembering, I've been thinking a lot about my experience of being at school in recent days, and there was much that mm. was very good about being at school. But one part of it that's becoming clear to me is that one of the things I learnt there was to avoid punishment. The whole orientation is whatever happens, avoid being punished. And I'm really good at avoiding being punished, it turns out. I did really well at that at school. Mm. I wasn't the kind of person who was throwing myself into confrontation with the system and i'm starting to see now at this point in my life ways in which that has made the kind of transparency that you're calling for difficult because to be transparent i have to risk mm. be transparent about being angry or being afraid or even being hopeful or joyful or excited or longing or <laughs> to be transparent about all of those is is to risk myself mm. And that's what this piece is really calling for is, is it's calling us to focus in a way 
that has us in relationship with others because that's what it is to make something is to make something for mm -hmm. and is to risk ourselves and when we risk ourselves then we have a chance of building something from what's broken mm -hmm. so all of that was coming for me as you were talking about community and that wonderful book by parker palmer and which i'm such an advocate for and think maybe we should find something from it that's for some future point yeah, all of that was becoming apparent to me in, in what you were saying mm. and also kind of i feel as you're talking justin it kind of hurts it hurts my feelings if you like um to feel all the ways that we don't do the thing you said just to be together and be honest be in relationship and be honest and it's such a gift when we do that and i very much remember what it's like to not do that and it's quite um violating to not be able to do that you know, it's quite a violation to not be able to be transparent. And, you know, actually, my sister and I, I'm not, not sure if Holly's watching today, but her children often tell stories of kind of ultimate transparency to people outside of the family about, you know, in what particular way we go to the toilet or what, you know, what we said at the dinner table that was bad or something, and you find yourself going... Oh, one, one time, actually, my niece, I went to the school with her, to her school with her, and her, her dance teacher came out, and her dance teacher said, oh, oh hello, lovely to meet you, whatever. And, and my niece said, oh, my auntie Lizzie, she does amazing impressions of you. Do you want her to do one for you? And I was like, oh, hello, dance teacher. I actually do do impressions of you, but I'm not sure they're very appropriate, and uh, I'm not sure I can do one in front of you right now. But... And it was really, it was actually very, very funny. And I didn't do an impression of her to her, surprisingly enough. But it made me feel into just how alive and vibrant the will to be transparent is and how natural it is as well. That, you know, my niece didn't get that I wouldn't do an impression to the dance teacher or the dance teacher. That it was like, well, why wouldn't you? It was great. I loved your impression of the dance teacher. Can you do it to the dance teacher? And in that moment, I could feel my own, oh my gosh, she's told the dance teacher I do impressions of her. What must the dance teacher think of me? But for, 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 for my niece, it was like, she absolutely adores transparency. And so I, I can feel as well the naturalness of us when we're little to just want everything to be open. And then we get told to not tell certain people certain things about us or to reveal. I also have a fridge magnet that says um, something like, to anybody else, we look like a, a perfectly normal family. Because I, I feel like I have to remind myself all the time that it's important to be revealing. It's important to be open with the outside world and to be in community in a way that shows everyone something of us rather than just the polished version when we all turn up to a dinner party or something but to actually be real and to not do that feels like a violation to not do that feels like a constraint that has me feel unreal and inauthentic and like I'm pretending which is I think has certain deeper constraints as well when you're trying to be creative because if you can't be creative with what you genuinely authentically are and you're only trying to be creative with the with the polished version of yourself it's a really different thing that gets made yes. for sure and that's that's why um taking up practices of creating where we can re reveal ourselves is so important because mm. your example with the dance teacher is a great one which is there are reasons why we're not transparent everywhere mm. Sometimes our transparency will shame someone or sometimes our transparency would put us at risk because not everybody in the world has good intentions towards us. And we make ourselves, uh, making ourselves vulnerable can make ourselves vulnerable to something. Yeah. And because of that, we can learn not to be transparent anywhere. 
Yeah. It can learn to not to be transparent when it's most called for. And I would say, actually, it's often called for in the public domain. Mm. I was in an, working in an organisation last week, big organisation that is dedicated to taking care of people and the people who run the organisation, who lead it, you know, the two who have formal authority, were starting to talk with one another about how afraid and alone they feel. Mm. And it, it was an extraordinarily powerful way of understanding mm. and then being able to respond now, they may not choose to do that everywhere and in every moment, but art, if, when we commit ourselves to making art, and I don't mean being um, like a super talented artist, I mean just making things that are real, we have a chance with, of working with our own transparency and our own capacity to, to be hopeful, mm. to make things that can change things for the better. And when we share them, mm. things can change. And that's why... You mentioned Parker Palmer, whose writing is extraordinarily beautifully transparent. Yeah. Or Courtney Martin, who's writing here. And I can think of other artists that are in my, I know of, who are doing this again and again and again. And they teach us this, which is that instead of hiding away what we're ashamed of, bringing it out gives us an opportunity. Um, I'm repeating myself here, but to cultivate the light that's hidden right, that's seeded right in the middle of the darkness. And that's the light that we, the light that we need. I love this, that she says, nothing new would be built mm -hmm. if things were never broken. Mm -hmm. And that takes this bold step of allowing ourselves to be known. Yeah. So I think this is, uh, we're probably at the time that we should end for today. Yeah. I'm uh, so pleased you're able to do this from Guatemala and I'm in London. We can actually have this happen. Yeah. I'm so grateful for this conversation. I think this is like, I don't know, it just feels like the whole point of everything to me. Mm. And I think that Justin, you and I, uh, without having articulated it maybe this way before, this kind of transparency is one of the deepest kind of missions, I guess, of our collective lives is to bring ourselves in service of this transparency that other that others might feel the call to and the power of transparency in the world. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Lizzie. I'm sure we can say much more about that at some other time. I feel yeah. whole huge possibilities emerging. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your trip and thank you everybody so much for being with us. We'll see you next week. I imagine that we'll probably be back to our ordinary much earlier time, yes. 9am in London. We'll see you soon. Bye everybody.